set the stage for where we're at now in terms of chapter 16. Um, so we talked all about the anatomy, right? So we should have a pretty good understanding at this point of the structural components of the respiratory system. So the alveoli, the thoracic cavity, the bronchial tree. Um, we should have a good understanding about that bit as we move into some of the more functional aspects, okay? And so we're starting today the second packet, which is the forces for pulmonary ventilation. And this is different from the third packet, which are the factors that are gonna regulate ventilation, okay? Um, and so here we're speaking about uh, the forces and physical laws that affect pulmonary ventilation. And just to remind ourselves here, when we speak about vent ventilation, this is the mechanical aspect of breathing. So how do we move air in and how do we move air out? Now, as you probably would guess at this point, that involves gas laws, right? That involves some physical laws that influence how we do that, right? Especially the movement of air, um, which we'll talk about here um, on the next slide. So this is kind of our overarching question for today's discussion. Uh, air moves through airways similarly to how blood moves through the vasculature. Knowing this, what do you think drives airflow and what might slow down airflow? So kind of reflect on this for a little bit. I'll give you about a minute or two. And you can drop some responses in the chat, but what do you think, let's start with the first part of the question. What do you think drives airflow? If we think about air moving very similarly to the way that blood moves through the vasculature, what would drive or increase blood flow? Excellent, I'm seeing in the chat here, pressures, pressure gradients. Pressure gradient, so a lot of response uh, saying pressure gradients, and that's absolutely true, right? Having a differential pressure or a pressure gradient is exactly what drives air into the lungs. It's also what drives air out of the lungs, reversing that gradient and uh, moving air from a high to a low pressure as well. Okay, let's look at the second part of this overarching question. What might slow down airflow? Excellent, I'm seeing in the chat here, resistance. And that is true, okay? Resistance is another one of our factors that would slow down any type of flow, okay? So as we speak about air moving into the lungs, we're gonna rely or recall on those bulk flow principles that we described at the beginning of the, um, the circulatory system, right? That pressure gradient divided by any impedance, any resistance to flow is what is the, the driving force for blood moving through. Um, excuse me, for oxygen or air, gases in general, moving into and out of our lungs, okay? So air moves in and out the lungs by bulk flow. In other words, uh, the pressure gradient being the driving force for that flow. So air is gonna move from high to low pressure. So we're gonna create a gradient that facilitates air moving in the direction that we want. If we want air to come into the lungs, we have to make sure that the pressure outside in the atmosphere is less, is, excuse me, is greater than the pressure inside of our lungs. That's gonna create a gradient of high to low and air can move from the atmosphere into the alveoli. On the other end, if we want air to move out of our lungs, we're gonna have to once again facilitate a gradient. So having higher pressures in the alveoli, lower pressure in the atmosphere, and that will drive flow from that high to low um, pressure. And I wanna mention here early, we'll talk about this in a bit, but I wanna mention here early, we cannot manipulate atmospheric pressure, right? This is kind of um, intuitive, right? I can't change the pressure in the atmosphere around me, although it can change depending on my, um, my position relative to sea level, I can't really change my given atmosphere. So what I'm going to manipulate is the pressure inside my lungs in order to manipulate that gradient, okay? Oh, hang on here, someone's trying to get in. I'm not seeing anyone, it will usually pop up for me to admit. I'm not seeing, I did see that message, but I'm not seeing anyone waiting to get in. Um, so maybe they can try refreshing or um, trying just clicking out of that link and trying again. 
Okay, but thank you for letting me know that. All right, um, so we're talking about our gradient. We're talking about manipulating our gradient. And because we cannot manipulate the atmospheric pressure, the only aspect of our gradient that we can manipulate is the pressure inside our lungs. We can make it lower in order to drive uh, air down into the lungs. We can make it higher in order to drive air back out into the atmosphere. Okay, now we want to talk about the functional residual capacity. This is the amount of air that is in the lungs in between breaths. So we don't actually completely empty the lungs, okay? When you're sitting quietly, you know, quiet respiration, every time you breathe out, there's still some volume of air left inside your lungs. That is called your functional residual capacity. Um, and we'll talk about the two volumes that constitute that capacity um, a little bit later on. But that's another important aspect in terms of manipulating the gradient. The fact that we never actually empty the lungs, there is always some air left behind, and that is how we can manipulate that gradient, by manipulating the pressure in the alveoli and therefore changing the direction of airflow. Okay. So let's start by describing our pulmonary pressures in general, and then we'll, we'll add some more detail as we go. So the atmospheric pressure represented here with a large P and an ATM, this is the pressure in the atmosphere around us. Uh, the intraalveolar pressure represented with a large P and ALV, this is the pressure of the air inside our alveoli, right? So these are the two aspects of our pressure gradient. Atmospheric pressure on the one hand, alveolar pressure, intraalveolar pressure on the other hand. We've also got the intrapleural pressure. This is the pressure that's inside the pleural sac. And we describe the pleural sac as being that double walled membrane that lines our lungs. And so it also has a pressure that is important in terms of the mechanics of breathing as well. And then we have the transpulmonary pressure, which is really the difference between the alveolar pressure and the intrapleural pressure, okay? And this is also described as the distending pressure. This value should always be negative. We talked about the fact that the uh, pressure inside our, our intrapleural cavity must always be less than the alveolar pressure. And so this must always be a negative value, okay? This is the distending pressure. This is the ease with which the lungs want to inflate. Um, and then it's also going to be the opposite, right? It's gonna be how hard the lungs are when we're expiring in order to prevent that inflation. So really important relationship, the transpulmonary pressure being the intraalveolar pressure minus the intrapleural pressure. And we wanna kind of establish this relationship here early that if I increase my intrapleural pressure, my transpulmonary pressure is going to decrease. It's gonna be really hard to inflate the lungs. If I decrease my intrapleural pressure, my transpulmonary pressure is going to increase. It's gonna be really nice and easy to distend or to inflate the lungs. Okay, and we'll, we'll, we'll visit that relationship as we go on. So let's add some more details here as we describe these pressures a little bit more individually. So the atmospheric pressure is usually described as an absolute value of 760 millimeters of mercury at sea level. And so this is what it is at sea level. Now, there are many different, you know, altitudes across different geographic locations. If you go all the way up to the top of Mount Everest, you're gonna have a way lower atmospheric pressure. If you go way below sea level, you're gonna have a way higher atmospheric pressure. So it's going to decrease as altitude increases, it's going to increase as we go below sea level, okay? Now, given that confusion and that complexity, the initial physiologist who described atmospheric pressure as it relates to ventilation, decided, you know what, we're gonna just ignore all of this variability with the atmospheric pressure, and we're gonna set it at zero, and we're gonna describe our other lung pressures relative to that zero. So thankfully for them, bless their hearts, we don't have to think about where we are in terms of our rel you know, relative altitude to sea level. We always just set the atmospheric pressure at zero. And then we think about our other lung pressures relative to that zero. Okay, the second pressure here, the intraalveolar pressure, 
Um, this is the pressure of the air within the alveoli. And again, this is gonna be given relative to atmospheric pressure. So we wanna be thinking about atmospheric pressure in an absolute way, it's gonna be 760, but in a relative value, it's always going to be zero. And then our other pressures will be given relative, excuse me, to that zero atmospheric pressure. Now this is gonna vary with the phases of respiration. So during inspiration, when we're taking air in, right, the diaphragm's nice and flattened out, the rib cage is opened up wide, we basically make the atmospheric pressure higher, or excuse me, the alveolar pressure is going to be lower, right, that's the one that we can manipulate, the alveolar pressure is going to be lower than that zero, so it's going to be a negative value. Remember, we're setting atmospheric at zero, and so if I drop my intraalveolar pressure below that zero, it must be a negative value. Okay, so during inspiration, the intraalveolar pressure is always a negative value because it's less than the zero that we set as atmospheric pressure. The opposite is true for expiration. So during expiration, the diaphragm recoils, chest wall recoils, and now the alveolar pressure is going to be greater than the atmospheric pressure. So it must be a positive value. Again, thinking about our reference point, our relative value for atmospheric pressure being zero, if I have a value that's greater than that zero, regardless of what it is, it must be a positive number, a positive value, okay? So inspiration, negative intraalveolar pressure, expiration, always a positive intraalveolar pressure. And so the difference here, right, is that gradient that drives ventilation. The difference between the alveolar pressure and the atmospheric pressure is that pressure differential, is that gradient that moves air in and out of the lungs, um, as we'll see. Um, next, we have the intrapleural pressure. So we said this is the pressure that is inside the pleural sac. It must always be negative. It must always be less than alveolar pressure. Um, and the reason that it's always negative is because this has to be a negative pressure, kind of a suction happening. The chest wall must always be tightly adhered to the lung parenchyma, to the lung itself. If those two separate, that pressure becomes a positive value and the lungs will recoil, the chest wall will come out, and that is not ideal for ventilation as we'll see, okay? So the intrapleural pressure, that pressure inside our pleural sac, our pleural cavity, is always a negative value. And it's always less than the intraalveolar pressure. Now it's gonna vary with respiration, but at rest, it's always going to be negative four millimeters of mercury, okay? The intrapleural pressure is always negative four millimeters of mercury when we are at rest, but it's gonna vary slightly, but it must always be less than the alveolar pressure. And as we described earlier, the alveolar pressure is always changing, right? As we breathe air in, it's changing. As we breathe air out, it's changing. But the intrapleural pressure must always be less than that value and it's gonna be negative four when we're at complete rest. Um, now, the reason that it's negative, just to kind of explain this here a little bit, we have the lung ha which has a natural tendency to recoil upon itself. Um, and when we think about the lungs, typically when we draw them in diagrams or if we think about them in the body, we're always thinking about them nice and inflated, but they are elastic in nature. The alveoli themselves are very elastic in nature. And if they were not adhered, to the chest wall via that pleural connection, they would naturally want to just collapse and recoil inward. The chest wall is the opposite. The chest wall, the chest wall, excuse me, wants to recoil outward. Okay. And again, if it were not adhered to the lung via that pleural connection, it would naturally just kind of blow out and we'd have that nice rounded bowel chest. And so it's really the connection, that pleural connection that keeps the lungs inflated and outward towards the chest and keeps the chest wall kind of recoiled and connected to the lungs. And so that negative pressure inside the pleural cavity is what keeps the wall connected to the lung, connected to the wall. And so they're really moving in unison with each other. And so having any uh, introduction of air, which would increase the pressure in that space would naturally separate the lung from the chest wall. And that's not what we want for ventilation. Okay, so those opposing forces are kept stable by the uh, pleural connection, so the visceral pleura from the lung, 
connected to the parietal pleura from the chest wall, and then the intrapleural fluid, which gives a little bit of lubrication as those two structures move together with that negative pressure, that kind of suction happening in between that space. Okay. So here's an illustration of that. Hopefully this will make a little bit more sense here. So we've got the uh, purple structure being the parenchyma of the lung, like the lung tissue itself. Um, we've got the orange structure being the chest wall, like the diaphragm inferiorly, and then the uh, thoracic cavity, the ribs, and the intercostals being the more peripheral external part here. And then in between that, we have the pleural sac, right? So if we look, take a closer look here, we can see that the um, elastic recoil of the lung would tend to push it inward, right? So it wants to kind of collapse inward. The elastic recoil of the thoracic cavity would tend to push it outward, right? It wants to kind of blow out or kind of expand. And so the pleural sac being connected on the visceral aspect of the lung and the parietal aspect of the thoracic cavity, along with that negative pressure, right, that suction happening in this space and that small amount of intrapleural fluid, which accommodates the movement, this is what keeps these two structures adhered and prevents them from separating from each other. Okay, now this is just illustrating what would happen if we were to introduce air into this space. And I kind of talked about this on Friday, but this is called a pneumothorax. So this is usually due to trauma. This is the most common cause, but you can see things like emphysema, um, lung carcinoma, sometimes asthma creating this environment where air gets into this pleural cavity. And what that does is it separates that suction because we now have a positive intrapleural pressure right, which is not what we want, um, we now see the separation of the visceral pleura adhered to the lung down here, the parietal pleura adhered to the thoracic cavity, and so the introduction of air here separates those two structures, collapses the lungs, and you can no longer um, ventilate this lung adequately because you've lost that connection, okay. Um, and so this is really important uh, aspect to point out because if we don't have this connection, we don't ventilate the lungs. Really, really important connection here. And then the final pressure we want to kind of clarify is the transpulmonary pressure. Now, we said that this was the difference between the alveolar pressure and the intrapleural pressure. And so this is going to be the distending pressure across the lung wall. This is how easy it is for the lungs to inflate or distend and allow for that pressure gradient so that air can move in. Okay, if we increase the distending pressure, the lungs want to increase, they want to expand or inflate more easily. Okay, um, and we do so by changing the volume, which will then change the pressures as we'll talk about later on. 